Welcome to the Mosquito Steve Radio Show on Talk Radio 1190. It's more than just mosquito talk. Mosquito Steve will talk about natural products, organics, good business practices, and more. And now, here's your host, Mosquito Steve. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Mosquito Steve Show. We're back. And uh, once again, this is recovery month. So uh, besides mosquitoes, we are going to dabble in a little bit of recovery drug addiction talk uh, a little bit later. Um, I've got a great guest here who is on headset with us. So uh, Jimmy Capra, if you feel like chiming in at any time, if you hear me say something about mosquitoes you don't like, you just (laughs) chime right on in, okay? So welcome to Jimmy. And uh, you've got the, the last three segments are all yours and I am really excited. I really am because I got to tell you, I have a love for law enforcement. I really do. I am uh, my patriotic blood boils strong, and uh, and it's actually since I got into recovery that that's happened. So I was not like that when I was out there smoking crack. I have to tell you, I was not very patriotic. Can imagine that. <laughs> and I also, I didn't like cops then either because they were picking on me all the time. Why are y'all throwing me in jail? That doesn't matter. I mean, I'm I'm just a little guy. So, uh, so anyway, so we got a lot to talk about. Uh, this is Recovery Month. Um, uh, this is a pre-recorded show. I'm just saying that out loud because. Uh, there's a reason for that because um, the data that I'm going to give you on West Nile virus and Zika may not be up to date. So um, we're doing a um, a recovery day down in South Dallas um, on uh, so on today today Saturday. So I'm from 11 to 4 at the Words of Faith Missionary Baptist Church on. Um, I'm going to forget the name of the street, Dinsbury or something. Anyways, it's uh, down South Dallas. And so we're out there all day. We're trying to bring in the community because we've got a repro- recovery program. We're trying to reach out to um, to the local community there. And they're actually, you can buy crack about two blocks from where we have our recovery meetings on Thursday night. So, uh, so it's pretty, pretty rough neighborhood. But anyways, I'm real excited that we're going to have recovery. We're having an open house. We're cooking hot dogs outside and welcome them in the neighborhood. So let's talk mosquitoes for just a minute. Um, okay, so Zika, let's uh, get the latest update on the Zika virus. I really should have some theme music for that. You know, da, 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 da. here comes the Zika virus update. Um, so Zika virus, as you guys know, we still have no human cases in Texas. Uh, in Florida, we have about 40 cases of Zika that came from mosquitoes. Otherwise... Uh, all the human cases we have here were sexually transmitted. So, you know, you see, I've been hearing a lot of talk about, well, is it really a sexually transmitted disease? Well, in America, it really is, for the most part, a sexually transmitted disease. Um, I don't understand it. But here's the thing is, like, guys, if you don't want Zika, if you're getting pregnant or you, or you are pregnant, don't travel to Puerto Rico. Don't travel to Brazil. You know, this is, um, I mean, you just got to take some personal responsibility here and not travel to those places. And so, um, anyways, we have total uh, in the U.S., there's a couple of thousand cases. I think it's close to 2,500 now. About 25% of those are in Florida. So um, that is a lot of them are from those places. So they travel a lot back and forth. And so uh, that's where most of this stuff is congregated. They're spraying some awful stuff there, guys. Uh, the CDC actually came out and said, hey, guess what? This isn't working as well as we thought it would. And uh, evidently, the CDC says this. So this is not from me. The director of the CDC said, looks like the mosquitoes are building resistance to these pesticides. Well, guess what? They have been building a resistance for a long time. Uh, in fact, this week, there's some news um, coming out of California. They're actually going to try some sterile male mosquitoes. They introduce them into the population, and then that what happens is eventually that, you know, they don't repopulate. Um, There has been some success outside of the U.S. and some studies for this. My only concern about this is that here's what I know about mosquitoes, and this is from Hundreds of tests. This is me standing outside counting mosquitoes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. This is me seeing them in their environment, see how they act. And, I, and I, in fact, I, I actually grow mosquitoes at my house. I have a little cage, and I have mosquitoes in there. And so, yeah, I bet you don't know anybody else that has a cage of mosquitoes in their house, do you? 
<laughs> so, uh, so I grow mosquitoes in my house, and I'm always testing and observing them. And I can tell you right now, they they actually um, they adapt very very quickly. So in North Texas, the um, the larval stage and pupal stage of the mosquito used to be normal, like in other places, it used to be two weeks. Well, here it's five days because of the drought, because puddles don't stick around for two weeks because of the heat and the drought. So they're in a few years. Their larval and pupal stages went from two weeks to five days. That's how quickly they adapt. So the fact that we've been spraying these pesticides for over 50 years, you know, of course the mosquitoes have built up a resistance. Of course they have. They adapt really quickly. My concern about the sterile male mosquito is that the survival of the mosquito is what drives their adaptation. And what I believe will happen is that they will adapt to where the sterile male mosquito will not be able to compete. And so it will only, um, uh, you know, uh, copulate with the male mosquito that is virile. And so I think that's probably what's going to happen, just like with genetically modified mosquitoes. I think what will happen eventually is we'll end up having a super mosquito because they're going to survive. They're going to survive, I promise you. When, when after the nuclear war and all the dust settles, guess what? <laughs> Cockroaches and mosquitoes will be the last ones here on Earth. And it wouldn't surprise me if the mosquito didn't outlast the cockroach. So, anyway, so I think what we're doing about all this chemical spraying. Now, I will tell you, there's a, a South Portland, Maine, has actually outlawed uh, chemical pesticides as of, I think, May of 2000. Uh, 17, and so uh, I'm actually going to send some products up there. But uh, but I believe that that is a that's a good move. And the thing is, is that we can control mosquitoes without killing everything else, without killing bees, without indiscriminate spraying. Because anything that kills a mosquito kills ladybugs, butterflies, and bees. Don't let anybody tell you that they can they can kill uh, mosquitoes and not kill other insects because they absolutely do. Uh, pyrethroids, the synthetic version of pyrethrins, which are a couple of the big, you know, uh, most li- widely used pesticides, actually kill cats. It says it on the label. They kill fish. It says it on the label. Highly toxic to bees. It says it on the label. So they're not trying to hide. I'm sure they would. If they didn't have to tell us those things, they wouldn't. It's not like pesticide companies are our friends, are they? It's like big pharma. I keep saying this over and over. You know, the public relations companies that used to work for tobacco, they used to go in front of Congress and talk to us and say, smoking's not bad for you. Why, a couple of cigarettes a day is actually good for you. (laughs) Those are the same public relations guys that are working for big pharma and big pesticide companies now. So, So do you trust them? You know, I don't know. That's up to you. But... I trust that um, I don't trust those. I trust my gut, and I can tell you right now, because I'm a God-fearing man, and I have to tell you, until I sobered up, I never knew this, but but you know, God's been speaking to me often, and and it's He speaks to me through my gut. I don't hear words in my head. Thank God, uh, I did actually when I was out drinking back in those days. I mean, I'll tell you, I see the guys downtown, you know, the homeless guys, and they're walking around there. They're talking and there's nobody there, but they're moving their arms and they're having conversations and there's nobody around them. Well, I see that. And I got to tell you, that's where I was headed because I've had days like that when I was drinking and doing drugs. And I mean, I would have I could live my whole life sitting in a chair with nobody around me and not get lonely. Um, boy, I mean, I got lonely real quick when I quit drinking. But uh, uh, but anyways, this. Uh, so so I think that, you know, I'm I'm just on the verge of sanity here. So, but thank God for recovery. So what's happened is, is I've been following these urges that God's putting in my gut. That's why I've stuck with the mosquito stuff for 15 years now. And, you know, for 14 of those years, I didn't get paid. And so this has all been just a passion and a love of mine to to help get the truth out there. So uh, real quickly, let me touch on West Nile virus. So West Nile virus numbers, we had our second death of West Nile virus uh, in Dallas. So um, this is typically when, you know, people start thinking, when the weather cools down a little bit, people start forgetting to put repellent on. In October, we tend to get a little bitty tiny spike of, uh, of cases where people are getting diseases because they think, oh, it's cool where there must not be mosquitoes. And that's actually not true. We will probably have mosquitoes unless we have a really bad cold snap. We'll probably have mosquitoes until Thanksgiving. So if it's not Thanksgiving yet, 
Please remember when you're outdoors to wear mosquito repellent. Even if you have a misting system, even if you think you're killing all of the insects in your yard, because I'll tell you, a lot of those misting systems are doing just that in your yard and the neighbor's yard. Even if you think that's going on, please, 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 if there is West Nile virus, if it's been determined it's in your neighborhood, please, please, please wear repellent. If you want to wear repellent, best thing to do is wear the best repellent in the world, and that is Mosquito Steve. So looky there, turned it in. This whole thing was about a commercial, the whole thing. So, no, but if you want to read about more about me, go to my website, uh, MosquitoSteve.com. You can find lots of information about um, uh, the, the natural repellents that I make. Uh, they're essential oil-based. My products have proven more effective than chemicals. That's the thing. That's why I'm in business, because I want to beat the chemicals. I don't want to just be another natural product. I don't want to be the best natural product. I want the best products on the market, and so that's what we've done. That's what I've been working on for years. So I am thoroughly devoted to bringing you, you know, I want to protect you better than anybody else, but I also don't want to kill off all the beneficial insects in the meantime. So... Okay, so that's it about mosquitoes, unless Jimmy just wants to talk about it. But I can see he's pretty silent on it. He's looking like he's confused. Uh, it's, I'm guessing he's going to want to talk about other things. So when we come back, we're going to talk to Jimmy Capra. He's former DEA. He's got some great experience. Um, I'm real excited about this, and he's a great guy. So come on back. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Mosquito Steve Radio Show. Hi, everybody. It's Mosquito Steve. Welcome back to my show. As most of y'all know, if you've been listening in, we talk about a lot more than mosquitoes here. This is recovery month, so I want to talk a lot about recovery. I want to talk about drugs, addiction, everything that's going on. Uh, Last week, we had Becky Vance on from Drug Prevention Resources, who I want you guys to remember because North Texas Giving Day is coming up, and you need to remember them and give to them. And so, uh, but anyway, so this week, another fellow board member of Drug Prevention Resources, Jimmy Capra, who, uh, former DEA, he's an author, he's an all-around great guy, and there's so much that we have to talk about, but I got, first of all, you you smiled when you heard that music, so I see that you're recognizing that music, so you didn't have to be a drugged out wacko (laughs) to enjoy all those tunes, okay. It's great. My kids call me old for a reason. Dad, what are you listening to? (laughs) Well, I have to tell you, so Drugs, Inc. is my favorite show. And so before we get started, I have to know, do you watch Drugs, Inc.? No, I don't. Okay, on that to you. You know what? It's it's very difficult for a guy that's served nearly three decades uh, to watch anything on T relative to the talking heads who talk about the issues. There are some really good... Good shows. Actually, there's a great show that's on Netflix right now called Narcos. It's oh, yeah. Two of my very close friends, uh, while we served together, uh, while they were busy in Colombia, we were in, in Los Angeles. So a lot of that, there's a lot of entertainment in that, probably half of it's entertainment, but they stick to pretty much a lot that happens down there. I, I just, yeah, I, I joke, I tell people I have the spiritual gift of criticism. So when I look at when somebody produces something about drugs, drug enforcement, or, or other issues, um, I, I have a hard time because I pick at things and yep. say that's not really how the real world operates. So I have to be careful about those because there are a lot of good programs. Well, and that's what I love about so Drugs Inc. actually does a, from the point of view. They actually ride around with the dealers right. and and interview these dealers who have masks and classes on. And in fact, one of the most the the shows I saw uh, that moved me the most was they were in Denver right after they legalized pot. Yeah. And the officers were saying, well, you know, we were actually backing off all drugs because we that's what we were told. Right. And, uh, you know, the mayor's office said, you know, guys, we got to back off. So so now all of a sudden you're all drugs, not just pot, but all drugs are running rampant. And they actually videotaped from this office across from a park in downtown Denver, these guys selling crack. And they said, one day a month, we'll go down there and we'll bust them for about three hours. They're out in a few hours later and... That's all we do. And so um, so this is why this is really why I want to talk to you, because I want to get from your point of view. What is this legalized marijuana thing doing for us? Yeah, there, there has been um, it, it's funny because I'm in the process of uh, I was just sharing earlier of, of finishing our, our next book. And, and in it, I talk about drugs and how I you know, there are people who I have six great kids, uh, no kidding, and, and a wife of over 35 years. And I've been told by other people, well, your kids turn out good because you're a, you're a dope cop. I go, no, I have, I have actually a lot of acquaintances and friends whose children are dealing with a whole host of issues to include substance abuse 
emotional issues. So it has nothing to do with that. But we've we talked to them about the seriousness of it. And what I used to start talking to them about years ago was marijuana because there's this false narrative out there that, hey, it's just a harmful That's drug. That's right. You know, when I, and when I was growing up, everybody was was in the 70s and, and yeah, it's not a big deal. Hoo-ha, everything is great. Well, it, it, it had a low content back there, low THC content back there. It's still dangerous drugs. The 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 legalization movement, which is a very powerful, well-funded mm-hmm. organization, has continually pushed and put money into a program. And as they were doing that, quite frankly, the government or law enforcement in general, especially the federal government, I could say this now since I'm retired, has kind of slowly stepped back from that. Call it a state's right issue. And so some states have said, okay, we're going to legalize it. The issue, the problem becomes is you, you have legalized a drug that has a psychoactive uh, impact on you. It, it, it gives you an altered state of consciousness. And, and the issue is there's nothing wrong with it. And we've been saying for years, we've watched it. I've watched it on nearly 28 years as a federal narcotics agent. Some of the biggest money is made in marijuana trafficking. I, I've heard, I, saw, <laughs> I saw the reports when they legalized it, how this is going to stop the cartels from, uh, ah, from, yeah. from moving marijuana. So in the heat of an operation that our guys was when I was a chief of global operations, we are actually ch- chasing Chapo with the Mexican Marines around. And in a number of places, we, we seized, the Mexican the government seized tons and tons of marijuana that was destined for the U.S. So it, it's just, it's ridiculous. And the reality is now, here's, here's what we have. You legalized it. When you legalize something, you go, okay, we, we, we tend to say it's legal, so it's moral. So it's okay. Right. The issue is it's targeted to who? The most vulnerable in a society, which is our young kids. People, and you know this, anybody in recovery knows this, the longer you wait to try a substance, a harmful mm-hmm. substance, whether it's cigarette, smoking, alcohol, if you, you try that in your 20s or something, the chances you have an issue with it are minimal. It's targeted to, to kids. It's targeted towards it. Go to any – what used to be medical marijuana clinics throughout Dallas, which there were – not Dallas, uh, Denver – so at one point, and I testified to this before the Senate, there were more medical marijuana clinics than there were Starbucks in, in, in Denver. And if you go in and look at the packaging, right, the marketing is marketed towards kids. You've got to ask yourself why. Why? So here's what we have in Denver right now. The Rocky Mountain um, high-intensity drug trafficking area just put out another report. They've been following it closely. Um, when we pushed back, when I was on DEA, I pushed back – to the Department of Justice, they said, we're going to keep an eye on this. We're going to watch it. And our question was, who's watching it from the department? You tell me who's watching it. There's nobody watching it from there. I can tell you right now. We used to have to brief the attorney general once every couple of weeks. No one's watching it at the Department of Justice, mm-hmm. right? But at the state level, they are, they are watching it. So here's what you have. If you go there, I have a son who's, um, who's stationed in Colorado Springs. And he took a trip down to Denver. And I've, just, I've been to Denver a lot. And he said, uh, he texted his brothers and sisters, and, uh, and he says, it's like Gotham City from Batman. He said, tons and scores of young homelessness, uh, panhandlers on every corner, uh, it's dirty on the streets. This is Denver, which was one of the most beautiful cities, and still is to that, but, but you ask, this is what you want, and this is what you get. Yeah. Use and abuse is above the national average. Use and abuse. Emergency room episodes are, are, are climbing. Here's the other thing. Traffic deaths are up 21%, and the major, the major substance involved in that is THC, 21%. And yet, can I tell you something? I had a congressman, I had a congressman, I had a congressman a few years ago who said, oh, that doesn't happen. People who are on marijuana, they drive slow, right. so they're less likely to get into accidents. Right. This, is, this is the lunacy yeah. that is sometimes in legislation. So, and it's not about arresting young men and women. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do, what are we leaving for the next generation? Right. What, why don't we want, we want you to succeed. That's what we want. We want young men and women to succeed in life. That's why. It, and, it, and it's just, it's a shame because I think there are about 17 or 18 other states right now um, on the ballot that are looking at legalizing marijuana. And, and, and I told a congressman from Florida a couple of years ago, who they were determining whether or not to open medical marijuana clinics. I said, you will see, if you open a clinic, you will see how many sick people are in Florida. You will be shocked at the number of sh- sick people in, yes. in, in California, <laughs> in, in Florida. In, in California alone, when they started opening it, 
the lines were down to blocks. But here's the deal. People were sick from Thursday to Saturday. Right. That's when they were sick. But see, this is what I don't understand. So people want, to, uh, I, every time I see this on Facebook, in fact, I know a couple of moms that are constantly putting this. They don't want legal pot. They don't want everybody smoking pot. But they think that's the only way to get medical. Mar- their, their kids are having seizures, and they mm-hmm. want this stuff for their kids. Right. And I understand that. So I so surely there's a way that there's a compromise, well, surely. There, well, there is. First of all, in the United States, we have a very robust system by which we approve a medicine. Marijuana is the only drug, and it is a drug, still a Schedule One drug. Why is it a Schedule One drug? There's no, right, the scientists, not the law enforcement guys. The law enforcement guys enforce the law. Right. They're not the ones who determine this. Science and medicine say, hey, listen, man, there's still no, there's no medical reason to have this. It's a dangerous substance, and it's addictive, which people said it's not addictive. It is addictive. We have more young people in recovery and in and getting help for marijuana than all the other drugs combined. Right. People think we're making that up. We don't we don't get the stats. Yep. You know, National Institute of the Health will provide that for you. Uh, so parents, unfortunately, who are dealing with really tough issues with their children see this as a hope. I don't blame them. But do you want do you do you want Tad and Chad in the back of a store squeezing oil out of a plant or however they get it and say, here you go, here's the right. magic. Right. Here's the magic. And some neurologists have said, hey, listen, there is some, there is some, seems to be some impact. Our, our problem is, is we don't know if, if it's having a real neurological impact on the child or if the child is actually becoming intoxicated. You, you see what I mean? Oh, that, yeah, if yeah, that's yeah. going to keep it down. Huh. I don't blame a parent. I do not blame a parent who says, I, I, listen, six kids I have, I, I, would, I tell people all the time, it sounds bizarre. I would lie, cheat, and steal if you gave him 30 more seconds of breath on this planet. I, I get that. The issue is we don't, we don't decide by vote what's a medicine and what isn't a medicine. Right. Yep. And, and, and by the way, that's Very why we did point. away with snake oil salesmen at the turn of the century because yep. it was killing people. Yep. We were running around promising this is what happens. That's not how we operate. And there is, plenty, there is research going on in a number of, of, uh, number of research that's going on studying what they call the cannabinoids uh, of, within the plant, which don't get you high. Right. But that's not what the legalizers want. Right. But if they work, they will, they'll be available. Absolutely. If and they should be. And do should work. be. Yeah, and yes. absolutely should be. So that's the, and that's the thing. You know, the, um, the, I, I study a lot about big pharma and um, I, God, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Is there any way we could stretch this into two hours? <laughs> so we're, we're coming up on a break. So I need to take a break. When we come back, I've got, I want to keep going in this, the same direction we're going. But, um, but I, I do, um, uh, the, what I found out is the FDA actually, if they have two tests that show that a product works, then they'll approve it. And they might have a thousand that say it doesn't, but only two. So that goes back in a whole other thing. Maybe we'll have it back on. We'll talk about Big Pharma one day. Sounds good. Let's take a break. We'll be right back with Jimmy Capra. Got lots to talk about today. Thanks. The Mosquito Steve Radio Show is back. Here's your host, Mosquito Steve. Welcome. Welcome back, folks. It's Mosquito Steve. Man, I tell you what, so I'm going to just, I'm not going to fool around here because we need to get back to Jimmy Capra. He is uh, an amazing guy, a lot of energy here. So I have to tell you, so I watch the show, um, Drugs, Inc. They're up in Washington, Seattle, Washington. Now, this is after they've legalized pot. Again, once again, the police have backed off. They're showing the streets lined with with uh, kids, heroin addicts, and they said that all the kids moved up there because... Pot became legal, but what's happening, of course, is now all drugs that you know that it's it's increasing everywhere. Here's what um, the and and this is what baffles me. So what happened was as soon as pot became legal, um, instead of the drug cartels going, oh well, they beat us, that pot's legal now. Instead, what happened was we saw the most potent um, meth that we've ever had in the United States all of a sudden appeared came from Mexico. These are businesses down there. That's what these are billion dollar businessmen down there. They're not going to fold up operations because we legalize anything. No. In fact, what they're going to do is they're they're going to compete and they, and that's what I see. Tell me from your experience. Yeah, it's not even competing. So, um actually right after uh, both of those states um uh, legalized for recreational use. Um, what we knew, what we saw happening right away, right away in the, in the global arena was major drug trafficking organizations setting up shops in those two states. They were there already, 
but the different cells setting up shops and using marijuana as a front business to funnel their cocaine and meth and heroin money through. And so when I sat before in the Department of Justice in a meeting one night trying to explain to them um, when they were saying, we're going to have to let these people bring their cash to banks. A lot of banks still won't accept cash from the marijuana businesses. And my question to them was, let me ask you something. I said, how am I supposed to tell the men and women who work for me that you have to, how am I supposed to tell them figure out what's heroin money, cocaine money? And they said, what are you talking about? I said, they are fronts. They're using, organizations are using these as fronts. We'll sell you a little bit of marijuana, but here's where also you can get your cocaine, your heroin, and other things. And of course, we were looked at kind of skeptical and they had kind of this long look on their face, but that's in fact what's happening. Don't think for one minute. Don't w- marijuana is called weed for a reason. You put it in dirt, it will grow with a little <laughs> bit of water. Okay. And with some smart guys in it who do some hydroponic stuff and some other things, you can yield a, a really neat bud. Okay. You at, with which is very powerful. But the other but the other thing, so if you think for one minute they're gonna get out of the business, no. So if you look at a map uh, gotten by research by the uh, Haida group up in, in Denver, you'll show how, how Denver has been the source state for marijuana through all the surrounding states and across the country now. Mexico still is the number one importer like that, but mm-hmm. it's kind of it's ridiculous. As a matter of fact, surrounding states of Colorado have sued the state of Colorado. It's going to the Supreme Court. I don't know the status on it because they're saying, hey, listen, because you legalize it, it's impacting our state. And so they have asked, the Supreme Court has asked the Department of Justice, what do you say? And so the Department of Justice has stayed silent on it because of two reasons. If they say, yes, you know, those states are right, that then goes against what they originally said is we're going to let you experiment with it. This is, see, this is the grand experiment yeah. that we want <clears throat> states to do. Well, the grand experiment is destroying young lives. Yeah. The grand experiment is, is, is ruining the, the societies that are, that are there. And I've been called a blockhead. No, my, you're reefer madness. It, it, it is not. If our, if our, if our, mission here, especially in this country, is to ensure that the next generation survives, does well, gets trained up so they can push us, you know, to the next generation. We're doing a poor job. Well, I'll tell you what, if we have to rely on the Department of Justice, I am, I got to tell you, I'm, that, that concerns me because I've not been impressed what I've seen from the Department of Justice in the last it, eight years or so. I have a, we have a lot of good friends and I have a lot of good friends that, that are within the department. Wonderful, patriotic friends, but, but it is there, there is still part of the, this administration. Every, every law, federal law enforcement becomes part of that uh, institution, you know, that, that political institution at the time. And well, it's very, very FBI difficult. Well, showing that, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so it's challenging, you know, it's, it's challenging. People look at it and go, oh, this has happened. This is, some people think there's this grand conspiracy. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not positive about this, but I will tell you from the marijuana front, if you take a look at the millionaires and the billionaires, that are pumping money into legalization all over the country. It's frightening. And I would suggest there are a lot of people who are saying, well, he is a former dope cop, so he is biased. I, I would suggest they go to a website called Substance, uh, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Uh, Dr. Kevin Sabet has it. He is a close friend of mine. Uh, he's a researcher at heart. He's been with three administrations. And he will, sh- he will show you on there a map uh, from people like Soros and others. And I'm not talking about tens of thousands. We're talking about millions and, and probably walking into billions of dollars. And you have to ask yourself, Steve, you're a businessman. You have to ask yourself, if I'm a billionaire, right, and, I, and I, if I'm a billionaire or a millionaire, why would it, why would I want to, why would I want to support, right, a drug in our country that where our young people are going to be pharmaceutically induced, there's going to be a pharmaceutically induced population that's disengaged from their family, disengaged from the body politic, disengaged from the responsibility of citizens. Why would you want that? And, it, and it's, I just finished writing one of the chapters in my book, and I, and I said that about drugs. Why is that? People say money. They have money already. They have, is it more money, or is there something more insidious? People say, oh, God, Capper, you're, you know, you're thinking conspiracy. No, what I'm thinking is ask a question, why? Why do you want to ruin young lives? And, and the issue becomes is because it's, it's, all, um, it's, it's all being pushed by a false narrative that the drug is not harmful, which is a lie, right. which is a lie. So if you're able to get people to believe that lie, there are things that you can do, you can control, you can operate, you can get ahead with whatever your goals are. And I think some of those goals are nefarious. Yep. Well, and it is a slippery slope because now that we're starting this narrative about pot, you know, I'm hearing a lot more people say, well, I think we should just legalize all drugs. Well, that, that I, I will tell you right now, 
and I've been saying this for years. Actually, I've been banging the gong for, for, for over a decade saying we're going to lose this if we're not careful about yeah. this. And so and I, I, I tell people all the time, and I go out and speak at a def- bunch of different venues, I, and especially when I'm asked about drugs, I said, don't think it's going to stop with marijuana because there's already a push to legalize small amounts of all drugs because, because the narrative is all that's in jail are drug users, yep. right? right? All that's in j- jails are addicts. Well, the United States of America, law enforcement officers, 900,000 of them don't wake up every day and say, you know what, today I'm going to go arrest some kid of color. Right. Today I'm going to go arrest some kid for a small amount, and I'm going to lock him up for 10 years. Right. That's, not, that's not what happens. Right. Mexico, what most, people, what most people don't know is in 2008, Mexico passed a law that almost decriminalized all small amounts, very small amounts of all drugs. Yep. And, and Mexico has been uh, hell personified. Right. Heads and there and people say that's because all the dope that's come to the United States. No, it's not. There actually there are groups, trafficking groups, and there's a gen by the way, there's a lost generation in Mexico from twelve to twenty three. Completely lost. No fathers, no nothing, destitute on the street, uneducated, ripe for the picking with these groups. And so strategically they're fighting over geographical places around Mexico. That's why the, a lot of that violence was, well, was now there. Now, why no fathers? Because the fathers are coming up here working, or are they these this, the guys that are coming have, up They here? have some of the same issues that we have in our yeah. country today. Yeah. Okay. We have some of the same issues that we have that are growing up without dads. They're growing up uh, without education. They're growing up poor and destitute. Mexico has very rich and very poor and a very, very small middle class problematic but but listen at, at the heart of things at the heart of things why the issues are so uh, are so bad there is because their approach to it and by the way the united states is one of the few countries that has really kind of a great approach we have we have a substance abuse treatment centers we have we have diversion where, where people get diverted uh we have uh our laws are, are designed to give people sometimes a second chance but the people that i went after for the nearly 28 years were major global traffickers but no regard for justice, no regard for human life. And, so, and, that's, and that's what happens. And they make their money right. off of the backs of those who are addicted. Okay, but, you know, so here's the argument. There's, there's the other argument. This is, this is not at all what I want to talk about today. But anyway, so what about the guys that say, well, so the war on drugs. So we're, we're not really winning the war on drugs, are yeah, we? That's, so, yeah. so, <laughs> so you got to ask yourself, where, where, where have we been for 40 years? Yeah. And, and people like to use prohibition and all the other stuff. And I, and I tell people all the time, they get really offended. I say, you know, actually, prohibition worked. If you look back to the science and the medicine, it actually, it actually worked. The reason it didn't work is because we were the only country, it, pretty much the only country, that decided we weren't going to have alcohol. All the countries, well, most all the countries, with the exception of a few Muslim countries, and to this day, don't allow alcohol. But that's, but, but that's there. And then the argument was prohibition created crime. Well, okay, let me, let me just take that from you for a minute. Okay, prohibition, what happened when... When, when we decided, okay, go wake prohibition, did the guys did the guys move in the booze? And by the way, they were moving dope back then. Suddenly, go, yeah. you know what? I'm going to school to be a doctor now. I'm going <laughs> to be an accountant, right? Did the mafia go away? Or, that's still the that's right. still the argument. Right. Actually, in our country, in the last forty years, drug use and abuse has gone down steadily. The the heroin use today, as we're seeing, it's climbing. It's getting close to the seventies right now. But in the last ten years, we're starting to see an increase all the way around. And, and I have a pretty powerful response to why that is, and I, I, I like to poke people and tell them why. Why? I tell them why because the families are being destroyed. Yep. That's, that's what it comes down to. I mean, you can, listen, why Johnny or Susie decides to stick their nose in a pile of white powder, smoke a joint or something, sometimes they just make a bad choice. Right. Right? That, that happens. And I tell people all the time, having six kids, each one of my kids is capable of, of making a, 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 a terrible decision and doing something very heinous in life, right? That, that's really, they're capable of doing that. Um, what makes it exponentially more difficult for young kids growing up is when they grow up without a dad. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, in fact, when we come back, we are going to talk about your family. By gosh, we are going to talk about it. I'm not going to keep, I, I love this drug talk. I could go on and on and on. There's so many questions I have about it. Um, so, uh, but when we come back, I want to talk to you about your family. I want to talk about your books. You're writing some books that are that I think are really, really neat, uh, family oriented stuff. Um, where there's a good chance we'll talk about drugs a little bit, but we're going <laughs> to mostly talk about family. So, uh, you guys come back after this break from our sponsors. The Mosquito Steve Radio Show is back. Here's your host, Mosquito Steve. 
think I'm going to have a son. Welcome back, folks. I'm Mosquito Steve. So, Jimmy, you may not know this. I'm here with Jimmy Capra. He is an author. He's a former DEA agent. You probably don't know he's an author because we've been so busy talking about drugs, <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to change that here for a minute. But I have to tell you, so I am the oldest living, never been married, single heterosexual guy. So um, I have I have no kids. I love kids. That's why I do the drug prevention thing. Uh, but I, I don't have any. It's one of my biggest regrets, I have to tell you. But I spent most of my years in love with cocaine, and uh, that it's not good for building families. So, um, so, but thank God you've got six. So you're making up for what I'm not doing here. So, uh, so I have to first of all tell me about your wife. Where did y'all meet? Yeah. And then in six kids, was that was that a plan? Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you, so I always say this, uh, my wife Shelly and I have been together for um, coming up on 35 years or over 35, I always add years to it, yeah. you know, I always, <laughs> you know, I, I do, you know, I came home one day and I said, I, I saw something, I said, I wish I would have known you longer so I could have loved you longer, I would have known you early so I could love oh. you, or really big points for that, <laughs> wow. you know, really. but she is the brains of the household, I tell people all the time, you know, I, 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 I um, uh, I was a, uh, I just wrote, uh, some of this is in some of my books and stuff and in, in my, but she really is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant woman. She, uh, um, um, she graduated with honors with a math degree in computer science, was, uh, had companies chasing after her, went to work for IBM. I met her the first day of college. I actually was in the service, got out, met her the first day of college, asked her to marry me three months later. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, but we had we had a long engagement. I tell people all the time. I said I did court her for a while. People don't know what courting means anymore. They don't know what courtship <laughs> is, you know. So uh, we didn't play house or anything else like that. But we we had a great courtship and 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 got married. And, and funny early on, we it was funny to find out that she said, "How many kids do you want?" And I come from a family of seven. And I said, I'd love, I've always wanted to have six kids. Don't, don't, young people do that. We don't even know what the <laughs> heck we're talking about. And she said, wow, I do too. So uh, by the grace of God, we did. You know, over the course of, uh, I, I can't, got on DEA. She was working for IBM. I got on DEA, started in Manhattan, wound up in, in Los Angeles and uh, all over the country. And we have three boys and, and three girls. Just amazing, amazing um, kids. But, um, but I will tell you, um, one of the reasons I'm so, I, I really am so passionate about and this this third book that we're working on right now, or close to finishing, it, we uh, titled "Raising Courageous Children in a Cowardly Culture," and people, wow, what's it, what's that about? I said, well, it's about our walk and raising our our kids. Uh, I am not going to get the Father of the Year award anytime soon because I, I tell people all the time. I said I, I threatened to pull body parts off my kids when they were younger. <laughs> you know, where was a t we were tough dad, tough mom, loved them dearly. It's not very sensitive. And uh, yeah, it's not very sensitive, but I don't <laughs> care. You know, it, it, it's like when people says, well, you know the. You know, we did not divest our authority to the church, to schools, to raise our children. Right. That was my job. Yeah. And and we failed miserably at times. I mean, we made mistakes and everything else. But I call it, you're racing into the arena every day to battle on behalf of the hearts and minds of your children. And we took that seriously. When my oldest daughter was born, you realize, oh, everything changes. It's no longer about us. And so that's what we do. And we're not perfect parents. And so we talk about what it takes to raise children of faith, of discipline, of courage in really a culture, we talked about this earlier, in a culture that's, that's void of moral absolutes, that's void of faith, that that's, lives in moral relativism, that lives in, a, in an era where we, where we worship on the altar of moral relativism, where we worship liberal tolerance, which means everybody's view is equally valid, which is baloney, uh, <laughs> baloney. If you're, if you're a psycho drug dealer, let's say you're not even psycho, you know, you're just Steve, the drug dealer, and you go, and we argue about the debate of that, and, and you're pouring poison into neighborhoods. Is your, is your view as valid as mine who says, look, we want to raise healthy children? Well, I, you know, people, well, it is. No, it's not. Stop it. It's stupid. Well, but wait, we can, you can run for president now yeah. if you like. Well, I mean, we got, he's well, only got 10%, but good uh, gosh, 10% uh, of this country thinks that it's okay to have a dope smoker as president. Yeah. Well, so, so the issue is, is what becomes our, what, what's our, so we talk about our responsibility in, in raising our kids. And they've all have went through adversity. They've all had challenges, uh, but they've all turned out to be pretty, pretty darn good. And most of that is on the shoulders of my wife, I tell all the time. But so that, that's, that was kind of our, our walk. And we get back to what we talked about earlier. When you, when you follow in the last 15 years where we are as a country, and I'm, you know, <laughs> As, 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 a, as a Christian who's still a chucklehead, I, I tell people, I'm still this chucklehead. You know, I, I don't, 
I, I refuse to think, okay, we're, we're going over the precipice, uh, although I think we're, we're dangerously close. But I think we, we have to remind people that we're responsible. Uh, we're responsible for our children, yep. not the school. We're responsible for our children, not the church. Uh, we're responsible for their health, their welfare, their safety, their training. Not not somebody, not somebody else. And it is difficult to do today, especially when almost fifty percent of the children born today are born to single uh, moms. Yeah, and, and, and that's challenging. And that's where drug prevention resources right. comes in because um, a lot of those families. Because I'm I'm with you. I mean, I, it's I think the the breakdown is because of the family breakdown. Right. But um, we we don't seem to be able to fix that, and so. I think drug prevention resources can come in. You know, it's amazing to me that just, you know, 15 hours of education when a kid is, is, you know, seven, eight, nine years old right. can have such an impact. We could stop 30% of addiction just from 15 hours of education when a kid is small and impressionable. Right. Think about the D.A.R.E. program years ago. Mm-hmm. So the D.A.R.E. program, great program. We The D.A. support it all the time. And and then all of a sudden it, it stopped. People says, ah, it wasn't worth it. We still got kids on dope. Well, because after elementary and grade school, we lose them. We yeah. lose them in middle school. No one else is, is pouring into them. Schools stopped talking about, you know, moral absolutes. We want you to survive. Schools didn't tell people, hey, your destiny your destiny is not an early grade. Your destiny is not in jail. Your destiny is not a needle in your arm. You're designed for greatness. You have a moral purpose in life. Oh, no, we, we don't dare tell that to our children. Right. Oh, my God, if we tell that to our children, oh, what are we doing? And, and that's what I'm talking about when we talk about pouring into kids. And I know single moms around the country who've done phenomenal jobs. And I know two-parent households who've raised just mutants because they, they refuse Yep. To pour into them. And and I'll go back. Let me go back one more. We could we could all be raising our children the same exact way. The same faith, the same discipline, everything. And that child's still capable of making a decision that takes them somewhere yep. that we never intended him to go. So so I, I don't dismiss that from young minds. I don't dismiss their ability to make a decision that they decide to say, you know what, I'm not I'm not following your rule. Yep. And that's well, that's life. And so that that was what happened to me. I mean, I I was brought up in the church, had a, you know, a five family members in the family, and uh, you know, it wasn't everything wasn't rosy. It wasn't leave it to Beaver, but you know, that's exactly what happened. So at eleven years old, I was put in a position. Um, I was actually left at a party where I didn't know a soul, and everybody was smoking pot at this party, and I thought that was disgusting. For some reason, I went to the liquor cabinet, got a fifth of gin, and turned it upside down and chugged it. Yeah. So. If already at that age, it was like pot's not okay, but alcohol is, you know. And what I try to tell people today, you know, when we're talking about these kids, because everybody's all wrapped up in, well, I don't think alcohol is a problem. I think it's pot or I think it's this or that. For kids today, it's access. Whatever they can get their hands on. If you're like I was and you get in a position and you want to try something, you know what? It, it might have been somebody had had a, a pill or something. That right. might have been what I had done. Right. But it's access. It's right. about access. It's like with the synthetic drugs. That's the problem with synthetic right. drugs. That's not what may not be what the kid wants first and foremost. But guess what? They've got access to it these days. But you know what? Kids listen to their parents. Believe it or not, kids listen to their parents. Yep. They're, 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 there's overwhelming evidence that shows that that that. Parents who talk to their or loved ones or adult, an adult, an active adult in a young man or woman's life that talks to them, that pours into them, yep. uh, they're less likely to be involved in toxic behavior. You know, they're, they're less likely to be involved in that. And so that's that's one of the things that, that I, I try to encourage men and women is that, listen, because I've had people say, no, I, I blew it. You don't understand, Jim. I, I blew it. I said, listen, I've blown it so many times, but get back in the arena. Well, my kid is older now. It doesn't matter. There's hope. There really, yeah. there really is hope. Look at, listen, man. There's hope. You know, I tell people sometimes we got to throw a life ring to our kids, and I've done that a handful of times. It's to pull them back in. You know, I don't want you going over the edge. Yeah. Uh, shelling up. My, I, well, I look at myself. Made mistakes. Have to look at them. And say, look, honey, I'm sorry. Dad, dad was stupid about that thing. And so, so there, there is no perfect thing there, but we have a responsibility to pour into them. Yeah. Well, and it was that strength, that that basis that I had. In you know in in a faith right uh, that's in family well, yeah. that's what brought me back sure. when I became ready that's what brought me yeah. back I ended up getting into recovery because of that that's what worries me today the the godless families that we're we're seeing being brought up these kids that have no they they lose hope because 
it, look, you can't depend on people all the time. You just can't. Yeah. People will let you down. So when all the people let you down, what are you going to put your hope in? And if you don't have a higher power there, or who I choose to call God, if you don't, if that's not there, what do you do? Well, I said there's no, uh, and I and I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I tell people that there's no objective standard. What's your standard? Yeah. Well, it's my, it's well, I have my own standard. Well, then it's just <laughs> an opinion. And if we all have our own opinions, how do you tell Hitler what he did was wrong? Yeah. Well, what are you talking about? He thought what he was doing was right. But but and I agree with you. See, if, without God, there is no objective standard. You know, well, so, so you, and people get off, they're offended right now, Steve. They're offended right know, now. Oh I my know. God, he's talking about I God. Know. I'm going to get hammered about this. <laughs> Half of my <laughs> listeners, if if there's any out there, they've all tuned out because I talked about God and because, uh, yeah, because I talked about these horrible things and and they don't. Have, because the thing is, is people think that uh, if you're conservative, you can't care about the planet. You can't care about. Um, natural products and organics, and and that's just absolutely not right. true. Look, it's all about personal responsibility. I want to be responsible for myself. I want to help those around me all the time. There's nothing. That's not a liberal thinking. That's no, conservative no, thinking. So, wow, Jimmy. Oh my gosh. Okay, so we got to have you back. In fact, you are welcome to be on my show anytime, day or night. Uh, and and I'm going to depend on you to help me get this uh, recovery show going. Yep. Um, I think it'd be awesome. Uh, you're a wonderful guy. You guys, uh, buy his books. Tell me the books Buy the uh, Leadership the at the Front uh, Line. And go f- look on my website, www.frontlineleadershipgroup.com. And my books are, my two books are there. You can also get them on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And, uh, yeah, come visit me. Frontlineleadership.com. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it. You guys have a great week, week and uh, we'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to the Mosquito Steve Show. Tune in each Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. as Mosquito Steve addresses all your mosquito questions and concerns on Talk Radio 1190 or the iHeartRadio app.